Lesson 7 The Unified Body of Christ Sabbath Afternoon August 5 The members of the Church of God on this earth are as the different parts of a machine, all closely related to one another, and all closely related to and dependent on one great center. There is to be unity in diversity. No member of the Lord's firm can work successfully in independence, detached from the others. All are to use their entrusted capabilities in His service that each may minister to the perfection of the whole. Each is to work under the supervision of God. By Christ's wonderful union of divinity with humanity, we are assured that even in this world we may be partakers of the divine nature. Christ has pledged Himself to cooperate with those to whom He has entrusted talents. He has pledged Himself to train us to be His co-laborers. He will help us to follow His example, doing good and refusing to do evil. We are to be consecrated channels through whom the love of Christ flows to those in need of help. Our High Calling, page 182 The Lord has need of all kinds of skillful workmen, and He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Each worker in every branch of work in the Lord's vineyard must have a head and a heart sanctified through the truth to enable him to see not merely the part of the work which is under his supervision, but its relation to the great whole. When the workers are consecrated to God, they will reveal the love of God for their brethren who work under the unseen divine master worker. We are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 We are all part of the great web of humanity, thread packed against thread to bring out the pattern of the fabric and make it a complete whole. Be God's thread to work out His design. That I may know Him, page 323. There can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. Talk of the love of Christ, tell of His goodness, do every duty that presents itself. Carry the burden of souls upon your heart, and by every means in your power seek to save the lost. As you receive the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the Spirit will ripen in your character. Your faith will increase, your convictions deepen. Your love be made perfect. More and more, you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. Christ's Object Lessons, page 67. Sunday, August 6. The Unity of the Spirit. Paul urges the Ephesians to preserve unity and love. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. By meekness and gentleness, forbearance and love, they were to exemplify the character of Christ and the blessings of His salvation. There is but one body and one Spirit, one Lord, one faith. As members of the body of Christ, all believers are animated by the same Spirit and the same hope. Divisions in the Church dishonor the religion of Christ before the world and give occasion to the enemies of truth to justify their course. Paul's instructions were not written alone for the church in his day. God designed that they should be sent down to us. What are we doing to preserve unity in the bonds of peace? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 239. 
A union of believers with Christ will as a natural result lead to a union with one another, which bond of union is the most enduring upon earth. We are one in Christ, as Christ is one with the Father. It is only by personal union with Christ, by communion with Him daily, hourly, that we can bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. The vine has many branches, but though all the branches are different, they do not quarrel. In diversity, there is unity. All the branches obtain their nourishment from one source. This is an illustration of the unity that is to exist among Christ's followers. In their different lines of work, they all have but one head. The same Spirit, in different ways, works through them. There is harmonious action, though the gifts differ. God's Amazing Grace, page 211. Many of those who profess to love the Savior neglect to love those who are united with them in Christian fellowship. It is not the opposition of the world that endangers us the most. It is the evil cherished in the hearts of professed believers that works our most grievous disaster and most retards the progress of God's cause. There is no surer way of weakening our spirituality than by being envious, suspicious of one another, full of fault-finding and evil surmising. Harmony and union existing among men of varied dispositions is the strongest witness that can be borne that God has sent His Son into the world to save sinners. It is our privilege to bear this witness. But in order to do this, we must place ourselves under Christ's command. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 242. Monday, August 7. Together as one in the one. God is leading a people out from the world upon the exalted platform of eternal truth, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. He will discipline and fit up his people. They will not be at variance, one believing one thing and another having faith and views entirely opposite, each moving independently of the body. Through the diversity of the gifts and governments that he has placed in the church, they will all come to the unity of the faith. Though we have an individual work and an individual responsibility before God, we are not to follow our own independent judgment regardless of the opinions and feelings of our brethren for this course would lead to disorder in the church. If hearts are teachable, there will be no divisions among us. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, pages 29 and 30. Unity and diversity is God's plan. Among the followers of Christ, there is to be the blending of diverse elements, one adapted to the other, and each to do its special work for God. Every individual has his place in the filling up of one great plan bearing the stamp of Christ's image. One is fitted to do a certain work. Another has a different work for which he is adapted. Another has a still different line. But each is to be the complement of the others. The Spirit of God, working in and through the diverse elements, will produce harmony of action. There is to be only one master spirit, the spirit of him who who is infinite in wisdom, and in whom all the diverse elements meet in beautiful, matchless unity. Our High Calling, page 169. In the first angel's message, God has sent to the church a warning which, had it been accepted, would have corrected the evils that were shutting them away from him. Had they received the message from heaven, humbling their hearts before the Lord and seeking in sincerity a preparation to stand in His presence, the Spirit and power of God would have been manifested among them. The church would again have reached that blessed state of unity, faith, and love which existed in apostolic days when the believers were of one heart and of one soul. Acts chapter 4 Verse 32.
If God's professed people would receive the light as it shines upon them from his word, they would reach that unity for which Christ prayed, that which the apostle describes, the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is, he says, one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 to 5. The Great Controversy, page 379. Tuesday, August 8. The Exalted Christ, Giver of Gifts. It was to the glory of God that the Prince of Life should be the first fruits, the antitype of the wave sheaf. This very scene, the resurrection of Christ from the dead, had been celebrated in type by the Jews. When the first heads of grain ripened in the field, they were carefully gathered, and when the people went up to Jerusalem, these were presented to the Lord as a thank offering. The people waved the ripened sheaf before God, acknowledging Him as the Lord of the harvest. After this ceremony, the sickle could be put to the wheat, and the harvest gathered. So those who had been raised were to be presented to the universe as a pledge of the resurrection of all who believe in Christ as their personal Savior. The same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise His church and glorify it with Christ as His bride above all principalities, above all powers, above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the heavenly courts, the world above. Selected Messages Book 1, page 305. Before he left his disciples, Christ breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. John chapter 20, verse 22. Again he said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. But not until after the ascension was the gift received in its fullness. Not until through faith and prayer the disciples had surrendered themselves fully for his working was the outpouring of the Spirit received. Then, in a special sense, the goods of heaven were committed to the followers of Christ. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. The gifts are already ours in Christ but their actual possession depends upon our reception of the Spirit of God. Christ's Object Lessons, page 327 The promised Holy Spirit that He would send after He ascended to His Father is constantly at work to draw the attention to the great official sacrifice upon the cross of Calvary and to unfold to the world the love of God to man and to open to the convicted soul the precious things in the scriptures and to open to darkened minds the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness, the truths that make their hearts burn within them with the awakened intelligence of the truths of eternity. The life of Christ is to be carefully meditated upon and to be constantly studied with a desire to understand the reason why He had to come at all. We can only form our conclusions by searching the Scriptures as Christ has enjoined upon us to do, for He says, They testify of Me. Reflecting Christ, page 132. Wednesday, August 9. Gifts of the Exalted Jesus The fourth chapter of the Epistle to the Ephesians contains lessons given us by God. In this chapter, one speaks under the inspiration of God, one to whom in holy vision God had given instruction. He describes the distribution of God's gifts to his workers, saying, He gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. 
Here we are shown that God gives to every man his work, and in doing this work, man is fulfilling his part of God's great plan. God established his instrumentalities among a people who recognize the laws of the divine government. Every gift, every power that Christ promised his disciples, he bestows upon those who will serve him faithfully. And he who gives mental capabilities and who entrusts talents to the men and women who are his by creation and redemption expects that these talents and capabilities will be increased by use. Every talent must be employed in blessing others and thus bringing honor to God. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 243. In sending forth his ministers, our Savior gave gifts unto men, for through them he communicates to the world the words of eternal life. This is the means which God has ordained for the perfecting of the saints in knowledge and true holiness. The work of Christ's servants is not merely to preach the truth. They are to watch for souls as they that must render account to God. They are to reprove, rebuke, exhort with long-suffering and doctrine. All who have been benefited by the labors of God's servant should, according to their ability, unite with him in working for the salvation of souls. This is the work of all true believers, ministers, and people. They should keep the grand object ever in view, each seeking to fill his proper position in the church, and all working together in order, harmony, and love. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 237 and 238. There are some in these last days who will cry, Speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. But this is not my work. In the name and strength of my Redeemer, I shall do what I can. I shall warn and counsel and reprove and encourage as the Spirit of God dictates whether men will hear or whether they will forbear. My duty is not to please myself, but to do the will of my Heavenly Father, who has given me my work. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 231. Thursday, August 10. Growing Up into Christ After the great disappointment in 1844, Satan and his angels were busily engaged in laying snares to unsettle the faith of the body. He affected the minds of persons who had had an experience in the messages and who had an appearance of humility. Some pointed to the future for the fulfillment of the first and second messages, while others pointed far back into the past, declaring that they had been there fulfilled. These were gaining an influence over the minds of the inexperienced and unsettling their faith. Some were searching the Bible to build up a faith of their own, independent of the body. Satan exulted in all this, for he knew that those who broke loose from the anchor he could affect by different errors and drive about with diverse winds of doctrine. There was division and confusion throughout the body. Early Writings Page 256 Our Lord designed that His Church should reflect to the world the fullness and sufficiency that we find in Him. We are constantly receiving of God's bounty, and by imparting of the same, we are to represent to the world the love and beneficence of Christ. While all heaven is astir, dispatching messengers to every part of the earth to carry forward the work of redemption, the Church of the Living God are also to be co-laborers with Christ. We are members of His mystical body. He is the head, controlling all the members of the body. Jesus Himself, in His infinite mercy, is working on human hearts, affecting spiritual transformations so amazing that angels look on with astonishment and joy. The same unselfish love that characterizes the Master is seen in the character and life of His true followers. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 731 Many know so little about their Bibles that they are unsettled in the faith. They remove the old landmarks and fallacies and winds of doctrine blow them hither and thither. Science, falsely so called, 
is wearing away the foundation of Christian principle, and those who once were in the faith drift away from the Bible landmarks and divorce themselves from God while still claiming to be His children. The church needs to awake to an understanding of the subtle powers of satanic agencies that must be met. If they will keep on the whole armor, they will be able to conquer all the foes they meet, some of which are not yet developed. The apostasy will increase. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Men and women have confederated to oppose the Lord God of heaven, and the church is only half awake to the situation. There needs to be much more prayer, much more of earnest effort among professed believers. Evangelism, pages 362 and 363. For further reading, The Upward Look, Stewards of God's Grace, page 379, and Testimony Treasures, Steadfastness Needed, volume 1, pages 462 and 463.